Greetings from the eccentric man, and I'm now back from holiday, uh, a nice time away in the north of England, in Northumberland, and uh, very interesting, very nice. If you haven't been there, I recommend going. Very historical, on the borders of Scotland, uh, very interesting. But while I was away, the FAQ and errata for bolt action dropped, and that. And today I thought we'd take a little look at the FAQ and errata for bolt action that's recently come out from Warlord Games. Uh, there's been some updates to some of the rules which people were uh, a little bit confused on and uh, so some good clarification. Uh, some which uh, have made people go yay and some that have made people go no. So uh, let's have a look and see what we can uh, make out of the amendments and the FAQs and the bits of erratas. So our first amendment is recruiting guns. It's, it's just clarifying uh, what will happen with the crew. Obviously uh, for recruiting artillery pieces the unit that's going to recruit it or the figures that are going to recruit it from the existing artillery piece must be within 12 inches. Uh, they're given an action dice and it's a 12 inch dash to the gun. Uh, so this bit of uh, amendment is telling you that any crew that have moved from a, an existing gun to join an existing crew will take the same uh, leadership level. So if they're in, inexperienced moving to a regular then they will become regular. So uh, however if they are a crew moving from an abandoned gun so they could leave the one that they're with to get to another one, then they keep their own morale rating and special rules. So just clarifying it up there, that uh, they either take the morale of the existing or they have the morale that they came with if it's an abandoned gun that they're taking on. So fairly straightforward. A slightly controversial one that's been uh, tidied up is in respect to vehicles reversing. Uh, I think there was a, a t there was something that came up on one of the forums uh, or on Facebook and Alessio saw it with regards to people were looking at reversing and then going forwards or different things like that when they were activating the reverse move. Uh, and it's clarified it here that reverse means reverse. And if you are reversing, all you can do is reverse. Uh, obviously, it's different to a recce move, but uh, normal reversing, straight back. Next up is the issue around escape reaction, uh, or recce, and the issue around high explosives and indirect fire. And the, uh, the rule book wasn't amended for version 2, and therefore you get the contradiction with regards to people being able saying well it says that you can choose to make a reaction um, after your shot has been fired which isn't the case if you look at the uh, errata that we have now you can actually see it. it's you've got to make the decision what your recce vehicle is going to do before the dice roll is made so it's not uh, Anything there that you can sit back and think, oh, let's see if he actually rolls to hit, you've got to make the decision beforehand. So that's a good little move, just clears up a problem that should have been cleared up in second edition anyway. Next up is just a small little errata with the LVT A1, and that's the option on the uh, heavy machine gun. So next up is a change to the uh, entries for the J Sherman Zippo uh, flamethrower tanks. Uh, and we now have three different options within the flamethrower side. We've got the early Sherman, uh, and you can see the points value there. For a regular, it's 235. Uh, medium tank, one turret mounted medium anti tank gun with coaxial, and one forward facing hull mounted flamethrower. We then get the later Zippo version, uh, and that's really taken away the medium anti-tank gun and you've got a reduction in price and down to 175 for regular. So that's your two main flamethrower tanks. You also get the option, those ones have internal fuel, flame fuel, and then you get the third option which is a Sherman Crocodile which comes with a trailer of fuel. Makes the vehicle slow uh, but it can be jettisoned um, and obviously 
uh, it's not such a problem for the extra volatile uh, flame thrower tank as you get with the internal tanks. So yeah, you've got a choice of three, so that's quite good. On next to the Armies of Great Britain book, and you can see that there's a change on page 25 to the commando section. The submachine guns option will be changed as follow. NCO and any other soldiers may have a submachine gun for two points each. So a reductions of one point each, I would think, for each of those. So, yeah, nice little lad uh, for the British uh, commandos. Uh, gives them a little bit cheaper option and perhaps you can squeeze in a little bit more. Next up is Axis and Allies and a change that many people have been really looking for. And that's with regards to Panzerfausts. They now are all five points. Another bit of tidying up comes with the Hungarian options to be able to take the Panzer IV, the Stug and the Panther all before they were actually made uh, and released to the army. So that's been changed. You cannot take them with the Hungarians now. You've got to have units that are right for the time period. So we move on to frequently asked questions. And there are a couple of big ones in this. Well, a couple, a few big things in here. So first up is the one straight away where it says about artillery and 360 degrees. Uh, and their ruling now is if the model comes with a turntable or a rotating mount, then follow the rules for 360 arc of fire. So that is uh, quite a biggie. So all those with your turntable guns, uh, which comes with the turntable gun. So your 25 pounder, interesting. Uh, some models of 25 pounders come with the circular turntable. Hmm, not sure about that, but yep, yeah, looks like you can have them going 360 degrees. So what's next? Cannon artillery units move in rough, well, in a building and fire from a different position. Uh, from a different window and the answer is yes if it gets an advance order so it can uh, change its facing to face out a different window or hole in the wall so that's okay but it cannot be given a run order because it's obviously it's in uh, difficult ground so sniper uh, what can they do where can they fire where are they counted as being well basically they have a 180 degree uh, arc of fire from a window or door and if there is more than one window, they can, in the next turn, fire from a different window. So it's a, a use of some abstract, abstract thought, thought, but the sniper moves around within the building to get the best shot that they can from that building. So, uh, yep, they can change position to get their shot off on different targets. This next paragraph just covers again uh, about the artillery unit, it can be given an advance order to change its position from one window to another in a building. Uh, so, yeah, just uh, reinforces what they've already said. We'll get confused with ambush and how it works, and this question relates to can a vehicle that's got a turret react in ambush to something that perhaps is behind it or to its side? Uh, and yes, it can. The turret has 360 degree vision, so anything that crosses its viewpoint is a target to be shot at from ambush. However, if it was turret jammed, facing one particular direction, then it couldn't respond to things outside of its firing arc. Uh, and that's what, it reckon, that's what it's really talking about. Uh, anything with 360 degree, uh, can respond to anything that is uh, to the side or behind what its actual arc of forward firing is. Uh, it's counted as being on ambush for all directions. So that clears that up. That helped. That was a little bit uh, helpful within it. Next, we look at high explosives and particular multiple rocket launchers. Oh, missed a bit on ambush, and that was that the unit on ambush can only fire at the unit that triggered the ambush. So it's not actually using a fire dice where you can choose your targets. It is only the unit that triggered the ambush. 
multiple rocket launchers, love them or loathe them. And to be honest, I particularly don't like them. They are too cheap for the possible effect that they have in the game. And with theatre selectors giving you the option to take two, or if you take double platoons four, uh, it's not very good for the game. Uh, and why? Well, it's uh, the way that they can operate. So let's look at the first bit, how you target them. And there, it's clarifying here. So you put down your six inch uh, template, and then you can measure the six inches a unit from there within six inches from the edge of that template. What they have said is that you can target empty buildings. And this is where I don't agree with the change to the amendment. By choosing an empty building, you can then target units which you couldn't have because of the need to see them. And for buildings, you measure the six inches away from the edge of the building, not put the build, not put the template over the building and see where the six inches are. It's actually from the edge of the building. And that gives whole scopes of things that you're targeting a building and people can say, I want to blow the building up because it gives cover to units. Uh, well, actually, for high, for high explosive and indirect fire, it actually makes it better because you blow up the building, that turns it into difficult ground because it's a, a ruin. So units in it will get minus two uh, to hit, uh, whereas in the building, for explosives, high explosives, they wouldn't have. So, yeah, not a good rule change, I don't think, but it clarifies what they have been saying uh, should be the effect. So target the building, empty building can be targeted, and then you measure to see what units are within six inches. Make sure if you are the defender, that you make sure that there are no enemy units that are going to be within six inches. Because if that's the case, it cannot be fired. So yeah, look to what you're looking at, uh, and that's multiple rocket launchers. I think really, price-wise for what they do, should be doubled at least, uh, and limited to one per army. Uh, even worse when you think you can have one in your vehicle selection, like the Panzer Weffer. This one I think can cause trouble. It's uh, with regards to units that are outside of rough ground, charging units which are on the very edge of rough ground. What this is saying is that if the unit in rough ground is just shy of the edge, then the charging unit cannot move 12 inches and enter rough ground. What people have tended to do is, again, you may be doing it slightly different, but we do, we say if you're within an inch of the edge, the unit can fire out without penalty, but can be charged. But in this instance, it's saying that if your front edge of your base is right on the edge of the rough ground, dice for it to see whether it is or whether it isn't. And I don't think that's a good way of uh, deciding whether it is or whether it isn't. I think it's much better for TOs who are running events or for people who are playing a game with friends or somebody uh, else is to work out what you're going to do. Uh, and I would suggest that if somebody claims that the unit cannot be charged because they are on the they are inside the wood, then if they are inside the wood, they will get the penalty for firing through cover. I think that's probably the, the fairest way of doing it. Um, because if you have a look at the, the amendment, it says that uh, it's the closest unit, so people could be very gamey with how they play and make sure that the closest model could be tricky to do it, but they could still do it 
that the closest unit cannot uh, be charged without the um, attacking unit going running into rough ground, but they are on the edge so that they can fire out without penalty. Uh, and I don't think that's uh, that's not the way that the, the game really should be played. So for our games, uh, I certainly will be telling people that if you're on the edge and you are claiming that you can't be charged, then you get that minus modification to your firing for firing in cover, that you are firing through the cover. Uh, so that the people outside will get some benefit, but they can't actually charge you. So just it just makes it fairer for everyone involved, I think. So are there going to be any more controversial bits coming up? Well, I think there probably are. And let's uh, carry on with our FAQ, and uh, we'll probably get a little look at some more of the army rules. There's a particular one in the armies of Germany, which have people gnashing their teeth at. So, medics. <sighs> Can a medic or an artillery mortar spotter fire the weapons of a vehicle they are being transported in? And it's no. Uh, they cannot. Uh, so that's good. That clears up little problems there. Similarly, spotters cannot fire weapons and cannot spot while in the transport uh, extending to them the rules for HQs which cannot use their special rules whilst transported. So that's okay, there's a little bit of a contradiction coming up. Uh, some units which can't use the first dice out, so if you've got a slow to fire, uh, such as the IS-2 that they talk about here, you can use snap to throw an officer to do it. So yeah, uh, most people have played that anyway, but this just clears it up. So that's pretty good. A um, couple of things that they're talking about. Uh, gun towing uh, and whether things can do it. And there's a few things that are around and about that cause problems. So six pounders in the British and 57 millimeters in the American, which were Jeep towed. But in the rules books and the army books, you can't do it. But you can now. And it's like with the uh, agreement of your opponent, you can do it. And if you're going to play an opponent who's going to say, no, you can't, don't play them. Uh, simple as that, really, I think. So, yeah, vehicles like this uh, can tow. So you can see it here. We think it's perfectly acceptable that... Uh, to allow those vehicles to tow them, but you should first agree with your opponent. What a lot of crap. It, it's their historical, so it should be available in the rules. Uh, and they could have done that in this instance as well. So, yeah, Jeeps, Cat and Grads, they can tow the guns that they were supposed to. Next up, one of my pet hates, forward deploying units. Uh, and it's, uh, it's sort of been a general creep in the campaign and theatre books to have lots and lots more of these forward deploying units. In so much as that you could have six, seven, eight of them in one list, which really can ruin scenarios but they're there and this little bit clears it up saying that um, these forward deploying units uh, can be part of the first wave and if they're first of the part first as part of the first wave their special deployment rules take precedence uh, so however there are certain scenarios with first wave where it says units are allowed on the board during the start of the game no units are deployed at the start of the game. Do forward deployment units still deploy in this situation? And yes, if they are part of the first wave. If they're in reserve, then no. Uh, which is a pain, really. Another rule which I think, why would they do this? Why would they say it? One man tank turrets. 
Obviously, um, if you are wanting them to advance or put them in ambush or anything like that, and they have to take a leadership test before they can do it. If they're going to advance, if they're going to run, sorry, or if they're going to stay still and fire, you don't have to take a leadership test. To, to come on in reserve, everyone gets a minus one. First wave, a one-man turret tank has to take a one-man turret test. So you have to have a minus one to come on. Why? Absolutely why. You're hampering a person by having it one man anyway, when it comes into the game. But why are you making it have that minus one in reserve on the first wave? Stupid. Okay then, let's have a look at the most controversial thing in the whole game. Tiger Fear. Uh, to be quite honest, I don't mind Tiger Fear. It, I, all the different books that I've read and the accounts that I've read, tigers were a big thing. People were very worried about them. Uh, and biographies of uh, tank crew with regards to Normandy were very worried. Uh, and certainly a lot of the leading tanks uh, were very concerned about tigers. Not that most of them were killed by tigers. Most uh, tanks were taken out by any tank guns. Um, but hey-ho. Uh, and therefore, big, big shoots on, uh, on tanks with the side skirts around the tank sides, around the turrets for the Panzer IVs. Yeah, I can live with that. What possibly I, I would prefer, or I think would make it much better... And lots of people talk about different ways of trying to fix it. So, oh, let's have them only affecting veterans, or let's say only veteran tanks can have it. Well, that it, it tends to get more complicated. Uh, I would say, yep, yeah, keep ta Tiger Fear. Just take away the minus one. However, that's not what this bit is about. This bit is about, can Tiger Fear affect units in transports? And the answer is clear now. Yes. So any transport, its passengers, will be subjected to tiger fear before they do anything. So that's gonna that has upset a lot of people. However, uh, it won't actually make any difference to my games because I've been thinking about it, and I've always included the troops in transports where the transport can see the vehicle that causes tiger fear. I've always said, I'll take a test for tiger fear. And that's what our group has tended to do. So it, it's not controversial for us that the unit inside has to take a tiger fear. Um, it's possibly a little bit controversial that people just don't like tiger fear. And I think they don't like Tiger fear specifically because of that minus one because it's a double penalty and I don't think there should be a double penalty so tiger fear yeah if there's tiger fear should take a leadership test to move but it shouldn't be at minus one so yeah tiger fear here for passengers and transports cleared up interesting one for the rangers uh, they've uh, ruled that if the rangers are deployed on the table with preparatory bombardment then there's a dice roll to see whether they are hit by the preliminary bombardment or not which oh, I quite like the idea of that can they get off the beach first can they get off the field first seems uh, seems an okay one to me if uh, they are in the first wave then they can make their onto the table move after preliminary bombardment, but before the first dice is drawn. So, nice little um, clarification on the use of rangers there. And of course, the last little bit covers what we were talking about for the Jeeps, the Airborne, and the uh, British Airborne, and the American uh, Airborne, or the with the use of the Jeeps for the 57mm.
little bit of fun on uh, Facebook with regards to the ARVE and uh, what it can do and what it can shoot at. And it's uh, just been clarified here that it can only be fired at uh, targets within 36 inches, which is the short range, and it cannot be fired indirectly. Uh, and that was because of the setup of the gun, the weight of the uh, projectile. Uh, it was aim built and uh, purpose was to hit pillboxes, bunkers, uh, to try and blow them up. Uh, that's what it was for, demolition really. So, not much there, just a bit of clarification again. So, armies of the uh, Italian Axis uh, FAQ. Clarifying the issue around the Avanti Svari rule uh, from, the, from the book. And, uh, you know, if you go more than two dice up, so if you get three dice up ahead of the uh, your opponent, the morale of the Italians goes up to two, up by two, so uh, veterans would go up to 12. It doesn't mean that you pass your leadership test on 11 and 12, it just means that 12 would be the start of where you take your pins off. So if you got pins off it would go 12, 11, 10. Uh, so that's what it does, uh, and 11, 12 always fails anyway. Last but by no means least, and hardly surprising, here we have the stance of Warlord Games on the theatre and campaign books, errata and FAQ. Uh, and what are they going to do? They're not going to do it. Um, it's too difficult really, I think, for them, uh, with the way they do the, the books, the way they task writers. Um, they're very random, some are good, some are bad. Uh, some authors play bolt action, other authors don't. There's no one in charge. There's no one directing the campaign books or overseeing how they're produced and how the rules all apply to one another. We've had a good one which has just come out, which has been um, the Hungarian book. Fortress Budapest. Uh, it's been done in the right way, but others haven't, and they're not going to be doing errata and FAQs. So they step back and say if tournament organisers want to do it, they can sort out all the problems, or you just use the armies of uh, books. So gives us a little bit of problem as uh, tournament organisers uh, with that. However, saying that, they then come and give us a few bits of errata for some. New Guinea book, the Sniper LMG can't use Sniper when he's using the LMG. Straightforward, really. Uh, here we've got the Road to Berlin. There's a couple of changes to it. Uh, some SMGs, staff battalions, little bits there. Um, looking at the LMGs for the motorcycle uh, units, they can take two. So that's been cleared up. Uh, bottom right, transports and tows. Uh, 0-1 transports per infantry unit. It doesn't say which ones should it just be truck, which is mentioned under tows. Yes, that's correct. So little ones there. Uh, also, Operation Market Garden, uh, looking at the Jeeps. Carrot can tow 57mm anti-tank guns. Uh, and a little bit about the armoured cars on page 22 and 23. So that's the uh, FAQ and the Errata. Uh, hope you enjoyed, well, enjoyed. I hope it was informative uh, going through it and uh, just having some of my thoughts on some of the changes uh, and some of the effects. So thanks very much for listening. And uh, I hope to get another video out soon. Uh, probably be um, the partisan show that I've just been to. So, yep, I think that might be the case. Anyway, thanks very much for listening. And uh, till the next one, take care.